When everyone in the fitness and health world goes left, I honestly try to go right. I see where all the trends are going and I start saying, okay, well, how do we look at things differently? Because where a lot of people go is not always where the hidden gems are. So while everyone's talking about protein, 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 which I love, don't get me wrong, I love protein, I can't help but think, if abstaining from carbohydrates occasionally makes us more insulin sensitive, would potentially abstaining from protein for short periods of time make us more protein sensitive? These are the abstract ways that we have to look at things in order to really get the best result. It would make perfect sense, right? There's these theories behind it where, hey, like you could stay away from protein for a little period of time so that when you do have protein, you're more sensitive to it and you get more out of it. There's a long known thing such as the anabolic rebound, which happens after staying away from food for a while and then re-eating, right? You have this refeeding effect where muscles soak things up and you potentially have more anabolic effect with testosterone and IGF and all kinds of things. So it would make sense. So let's take a look at the research. Let's talk about theory and then let's talk about the actual literature that exists now, because believe it or not, we do have some evidence on how this could work and how we might possibly be able to do it. Now, after this video, I put a link down below for a free sample variety pack from Element Electrolytes. So if you do go periods of time without eating where you're restricting calories or restricting protein and you just want nothing to sip on, well, Element is great for that. It's my way of curbing my appetite. It's how I curb my appetite for the last like five, six, even seven years, whether I'm fasting or not. It's something that just makes it so I feel satiated. So there's no sugar, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. So that link down below gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase from Element Electrolytes. So it's not just about getting adequate minerals and electrolytes in. It truly is a way to curb your appetite. So that link in the top line of the description, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. So we know this evidence with calories, right? Like we know that a constant supply of calories can give you some fuel and things like that. But if you go and take a break from fuel and calories, it can actually be good. It can be good for digestion. It can be good for insulin sensitivity. As a matter of fact, when we look at a study that was published back in 1969 in The Lancet, they looked at prolonged sort of starvation of people. Okay, back when they could like do a little bit more of that, could be a little bit more aggressive with some of these studies, they found that just some starvation ended up increasing glucose tolerance. They actually, independent of weight loss, so even when they look at the data unrelated to weight change, they had a significant increase in glucose tolerance, meaning they were able to use fuel more efficiently. So there was an adaptation that occurred by abstaining from food to the point that when the body did have food, it was able to utilize that food more efficiently and more rapidly. Wouldn't that be cool if we could do it with protein? Like what if we depleted ourselves of protein for short periods of time and then surged at the right time to get increased sensitivity to get more out of it? So the theory is that there's a protein sparing effect. So the theory is that, for example, when you fast, right, you can actually feel this effect of muscle being spared unless you go too far. So it's like the right amount of hormetic stress, right? So protein sparing implies that you're forced into better adaptation of preserving muscle. By occasionally taking away protein, just like occasionally fasting, you actually train the body to be okay with lower amounts of protein. So you actually can survive the gaps in between meals better which is quite interesting because it's almost like these people that want to protect their gains are always eating protein, but are they potentially enabling themselves by constantly giving themselves protein? In essence, you kind of teach your body to retain muscle. So yes, you could say someone that's consuming constant protein all the time, when they all of a sudden remove it, they might lose some gains, but the art would be in occasionally dosing it, right? But next we talk about muscle protein synthesis sensitivity. Just like there's insulin sensitivity, there could be an anabolic sensitivity. For example, with intermittent fasting, abstaining from insulin spikes and carbohydrates leads to a better use of the fuel. Would abstaining from protein lead to a better use of the fuel? And we'll talk about this with some literature too. And then of course there's the autophagy piece. By decreasing protein and increasing autophagy for a period of time, you might clear out some of the cellular rubbish that makes it so that the cells use fuel better. But anyway, 
forget all the theory, let's talk about some actual literature. Let's talk about the muscle sparing effect first with the scientific literature. So there's a study published in Nutrition Journal, and it looked at alternate day fasting versus a control. And it was really interesting, but a lot of people don't talk about the most interesting part of this study. First off, what they did is they had subjects go 25% of their daily calories. That was their fasting day. So 25% of their normal calories. The next day could eat as much as they want, even if they overate. It was ad libitum. The control diet just ate ad libitum, right? So they had them just eat whatever they really wanted within a specific range. Now, despite losing more body weight in the alternate day fasting group, which is no surprise, they had no muscle loss. So they lost more weight than the control group. Obviously, they were fasting or eating 25% of their calories one day, but they preserved just as much muscle as the other group. They didn't lose muscle. Why? Because their body adapted in a short amount of time to preserve that mass. Now, the other side of the equation is that there was a protein sensitivity upon the resumption of feeding. So even though they were maybe sparing some protein during their fast, it could have been the fact that when they did eat again, they resumed feeding, there was this surge in signaling that allowed the body to take up the protein better and get more muscle protein synthesis at that point in time. Then there was another study where they had subjects do what was called traditional caloric restriction, where they just reduced calories through the course of the day. And then they did intermittent caloric restriction, where they had periods of very low calorie and periods of higher calorie. What they found is that when they had these periods of lower calorie and abstaining from food for longer periods of time, they preserved more muscle. Both groups lost the same amount of fat but the group that did the independent sort of fluctuation of nutrients, like low calorie and then higher calorie, low cal they preserve more muscle. Once again, demonstrating that there's this protein sensitizing effect, just like there's insulin sensitivity. So where are we at with it now? Well, let's keep looking. There's this thing called the anabolic rebound. And this is where you have a period of restriction that's essentially increasing sensitivity. And then when you do feed again, you have an increase or a rebound in anabolism. This can potentially occur with testosterone. It can potentially occur with IGF. It can potentially occur with what's called mTOR phosphorylation, which we'll talk about. But it would make sense, right? If you were like starving yourself, your hormone function would go down and then you would probably see a big surge again when you do refeed. Now, this goes to a limit. It's not to say everyone should go and like fast for 10 days and then eat a bunch of calories. But the point is, is there might be this minute little change here. There's even a study that was published in the journal Translational Medicine where they had subjects do time-restricted feeding in a 16-8 fasting style compared to a normal diet. Now, the results here were pretty interesting. After eight weeks, they found that both groups preserved the same amount of muscle mass despite the time-restricted feeding group eating less calories. Now, it's no surprise that time-restricted feeding gets people shredded, okay? They're going periods of time without food and they're fasting and they're getting caloric restriction to a high degree. But how do you explain the fact that they preserve more muscle mass? Even with the fact that the TRF group, the fasting group, actually had lower testosterone and lower IGF, which is a downfall when it comes to fasting sometimes. What this tells us is that perhaps, this is speculatory, they had a decrease in this testosterone and IGF to a point where they actually had to increase the sensitivity to the testosterone and the IGF. So they became more sensitive from an anabolic signaling perspective. So then when they did eat or they did have stimulus, they might actually receive the signal better. Now that's somewhat hypothetical, but it's one of the ways that we can describe how this phenomenon sort of happened. But the real interesting thing is there's this thing called mTOR priming. And we look at a study published in the journal Physiology where they had subjects resistance train and then they had them consume 80 grams of protein over the course of a number of hours. They broke it up into different ways. So one group of participants had 10 grams of protein every hour and a half. Then they had the intermediate group. This group consumed 20 grams of protein every three hours. Then they had the bolus group. The bolus group consumed 40 grams of protein every six hours. Now, these aren't huge boluses of protein, but what this is telling us is something interesting because what they found was that there was more anabolic signaling, more mTOR, more P70S6K phosphorylation in the bolus group. Now, at first you're gonna say, well, duh, they're having more protein at one sitting. They're gonna have a bigger spike at the time of ingestion. No, they were looking at the total aggregate 
So the total aggregate, there was more protein synthesis, more P70S6K, more, more overall mTOR activation when they would have protein in these larger boluses more infrequently. So was it the large bolus or was it the gap between the meals? Probably the gap between the meals and the bolus combined. Because if you were to say, desensitize and have that consistently, you might not get that rebound effect. Again, that anabolic rebound that we're looking for. So there is some serious merit here. And then finally, the autophagy angle. So with autophagy, when you decrease protein, you inhibit mTOR or you drop mTOR and autophagy increases. Now this could do a number of things. Number one, you're gonna clear cell debris. Okay, so when you're clearing cell debris, you're potentially making it so that the cells can operate more effectively. Now you can increase autophagy a bunch of different ways. I'm just saying that if you go periods of time decreasing protein, you might be able to increase that a little bit more. You could also promote the reutilization of amino acids. So amino acids get broken down from other areas and get put into other areas. So perhaps you get a muscle sparing effect that happens there and you also condition the cells to be good at reusing material a little bit more. And then lastly, you might have what's called an mTOR rebound where things just bounce back a little bit more when you do come out of autophagy and you get more potential muscle growth, more IGF, things like that. So what would this look like for somebody? It's simple. It would be maybe taking one or two days out of the week or out of the month or whatever, occasionally sensitizing yourself to protein. It actually might feel good digestively for a minute too. I'm all for protein. If you watch my stuff, you know that I'm eating two to 300 grams of protein a day which means that maybe I'm getting very desensitized to that. So I've occasionally said, okay, I'm just gonna drop my protein down to like 50 grams today and I'm not gonna waste away. And I'm gonna do that to sort of cleanse the system a little bit. And you're seeing people do it with fasting, right? You see the sugar fast, all kinds of stuff, high sugar, low protein for short periods of time. The thing is, is that could you get some of the benefits from fasting just by decreasing protein for a short period of time? Sounds a little bit like Dr. Walter Longo, who's an awesome person's work, right? He's talked about kind of the low protein, higher fat, stimulating autophagy. It's like a protein sparing or a protein mimicking or a fasting mimicking diet, which would make some sense. So by periodically restricting protein, we could be onto something. Just make sure that you're compensating for it during the boluses so you can actually get that rebound effect. As always, keep it locked here on my channel. See you tomorrow.